Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good, and I'm very excited to kick off the hotly anticipated by at least the two of us Open <laughs> Publishing Ecosystems Flex course. Yes. Uh, it's a long time coming. It feels um, amazing to be kicking off this um, this flex course finally. I mean, honestly, it's something that we've been talking about pretty much since I started with Reclaim back in June of 22. Um, so being able to do it, I'm, I'm so stoked. Uh, essentially, I came from a background of open publishing uh, with the State University of New York system as an OER publishing coordinator. Um, so I, I've worked in this space and I just have been wanting to revisit it a bit because when I worked in it, it was very, there was a system and a procedure kind of preset for me and it worked for what we needed. But, you know, moving into this space and interacting with the community that we have, with these varied needs and varied resources they have access to and various things that we can provide and that kind of ability to explore has just um, really uh, <laughs> escalated for me. Um, and so I wanted to take the opportunity to really like look around at what is actually available in this space and kind of help people understand what true open publishing could look like. Yeah. You know, we, we're talking when planning this flex course about the idea of both exploring tools, which is something we do a lot on video at Reclaim, I would say, you know, just kind of like, what does this tool do? Um, but also kind of exploring, you know, sets of tools. That's that's the ecosystem part here, right? Um, but even further than that, exploring um, really like the idea of how open can we make this whole process like start to finish, right? Not just can we make a piece of content and make it, you know, freely available, that's awesome. But can we use free open source tools that author things in a free open source format that then publish to a free open source tool? And then it's a free thing at the end of it too. Like how, how far can we take this idea basically? And is there value to that? Like what, what, what is there to gain by doing that? Right. Um, yeah. which I mean, I don't know that there's like a definitive answer to that question, but we want to explore it. Um, yeah. that's kind of the point here is to talk about, you know, yes, these tools exist. Why might you do something in this way? What's there to gain from it? Um, yeah. And, and talk that's, a little bit beyond the tool. Absolutely. And that's something that we're going to be exploring throughout this entire course, especially in the three weeks after this particular, I mean, this, no, this this particular all of them are going to be addressing this and even even this one. But um, we are in the next three weeks, we'll be talking with actual experts in the tools. Taylor and I are not experts in the tool we're going to um, tell you about today, but we do use it. And um, but for the rest of them, there are other people who have developed the tools or have had a key role in development and um, you know the sharing of those tools. And we we ask everyone that question of like what why why would people use this and i think that i love that we have the opportunity to like you're saying explore here and it's kind of it's fun we get to play around and um like you're saying see how far we can push it and really i think there it's really cool to make a, a whole ecosystem of tools available when some people might only encounter one of these tools at a time ever. And so being able to package them up and say, here, like, here's a contextual list <laughs> of um, open source tools and what you might use them for and kind of give people the opportunity to um, take what 
what works for them, leave what doesn't. Maybe it's maybe it's a little bit of all of them. Maybe it's one or maybe it's none and it's just still valuable to know that there are other options than you know maybe what you're currently using yeah i think one of the strengths of really every tool we'll feature throughout the entire flex course is is that kind of mix and match possibility right of these can work great together or in some combination, um, or you can get value out of just one of them, but also they can live great as um, in different sizes of projects and teams, right? So pretty much most, some of the tools we'll feature are more geared towards an individual and some of them are more geared to towards a small team or a, you know, a, uh, a teacher student kind of relationship or even an institutional repository type thing. Um, and that I, you know, that we're, we're really trying not to narrow down in terms of the flex course of like, Oh, this is only good if you are interested in publishing OERs at a school of a certain size. It's like, no, we'll get some of the tools we'll feature will be really great for that. Um, some of them will be better for, a person who wants to write a thing and make it available. Um, and so that, that, you know, we'll, we'll get into that with each tool. Um, HedgeDoc, which is kind of the first tool that we want to talk about. Do we want to kind of get into that? Um, or yeah, or, yeah. The, um, this particular tool I think can run the gamut. It could be used right. by an individual person and it could be used by a group of people um, equally well. Yeah, and that's kind of why we're starting here. So um, HedgeDoc is something that we have been playing with for a little while here. I'm not sure actually when you started playing with it, Taylor, because I know that I had heard about it right before I joined Reclaim. I hadn't messed around with it, but I had definitely heard about it. Um, so, and then, and then it was shortly after I joined that we started actually digging in and doing some stuff with it. There was a, a session on the online portion of OER 22, um, and someone get I don't I should have had this ready, but someone I believe at that conference had a session on HedgeDoc specifically, and that's what made me aware of it. Yes, um, which would have been right before you started at Reclaim. So, and I think um, that that got passed around in my circles and that's how I heard about it. So um, yeah, we should definitely look into that and we'll um, throw it in the Discord chat uh, when when we're talking. Um, and I, so essentially what it is, is I like to think of it as Mark, um, Google Docs for Markdown. Um, it's a collaborative Markdown editing platform where you can have multiple users collaboratively writing a markdown document. Um, it also is uh, has live preview built into it so that you can be writing your markdown and then kind of either just look at the markdown or have kind of a split screen view and immediately see what um, the translated version of that would look like in a preview context, um, which can be really helpful for a variety of reasons. Um, and it also has, you know, color coordinating, all those nice formatting, um, stylized elements of Markdown, so that you can, you know, the headings are different colors, and um, every everything is kind of color coordinated. And so that's really nice when you're using something like Markdown, um, which then kind of leads us to this idea of Markdown. I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves if we want to maybe show folks what HedgeDoc looks like first and what um, what Markdown looks like in HedgeDoc. And then um, we can kind of go into why this is so valuable to, to us as users and also to kind of informing this larger Flux course. Yeah, yeah. Here, um, I'll pull my screen up really quick. Um, just show off the, the HedgeDoc website here at hedgedoc.org. Um, they uh, um, have, you know, kind of some of the things you just mentioned in terms of, you know, breakdown of what features are available and 
and stuff like that. But you know, the the quick version of of this the 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 quick demo if they in fact they have a a demo site you can actually look at which is cool um which we can just quickly log into here as a or make a guest note on um but this is the basics of what it looks like it's a web editor i can type things over here and i can see how they're formatted over there so if i you know make something into a heading in the markdown style or if i uh, is this italics? Yeah. Um, I can, you know, format text in the markdown way. There's um, a uh, WYSIWYG let me editor as well. So I can highlight things and say that's strike through um, or, or whatever, italics, bold, bold and italics. Um, so that that's this is what the tool is and what it looks like. But before we get too far into that, do you want to, talk a little bit about well what it what markdown is first yeah absolutely so um i think that it's important for us to kind of take a step back and and talk about markdown mainly because that is the driving force for um a lot of this kind of open editing work and it's going to be brought up again and again in all of our sessions and we didn't come to hedgedoc simply because of hedgedoc i mean we just shared that we heard about it or maybe encountered it at a conference and it seemed really useful but the reason it's useful to us and it was a, as attractive to us as it was is because it it is a markdown editor and um i know that we both have our own experiences with getting introduced to markdown um and we both use Markdown every day in our editing. Um, and what it is essentially is a, um, it's, it's a stylistic um, type, it's a type of formatting, <laughs> text formatting um, that when I first learned about it, they explained it as a riff on HTML. Um, but instead of markup language, you're marking, it's a markdown language. So it's a lot simpler than HTML. It's like HTML with all of the kind of crazy stuff taken out. And it's just very straightforward. You can make very simple stylistic choices with this language um, and just using plain text. And yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, um, Whenever I'm explaining Markdown to someone who's not heard of it, I actually go to, there's a page on daringfireball.net, which is like an Apple technology blog, but the person who writes there, um, Mark uh, Gruber, right? I think John Gruber, Mark, Mark Gruber, Markdown. Uh, John Gruber, I believe, kind of invented um, Markdown, um, or is at least, but anyway, he has a description of there and I always kind of go to this one of the first paragraphs in there, which is just it's two things. It's a plain text formatting syntax. So it's mm -hmm. an idea of how to format plain text. And um, there are software tools around that. Um, he has one, but there are many, including Hedgedoc, that can do things with that syntax. So, you know, can make it look like something else or export it or import it and, and do very many different things with it. But fundamentally, it's the idea of writing in plain text mm -hmm. um, on a computer <laughs> and uh, formatting it a certain way to provide you with formatting capabilities, basically, because right, plain text would be, uh, you know, just letters and symbols mm -hmm. um and i guess line breaks if you don't um have some kind of agreed upon syntax for formatting yeah and the syntax as we all know helps you make meaning helps you emphasize things and um so being able to do that in a really lightweight way is really valuable um and it's just got a really low um learning bar, <laughs> uh, barrier to entry, very low, uh, because it's just a few symbols that are added on to plain text. Um, so you can understand it. And a lot of um, processing platforms can understand it. And so when thinking about plain text, 
and the reason why that's so important is, and, and then this translates again into kind of markdown, um, which is just kind of the flavor of plain text that we're using, um, is mainly for us, the portability of it, and also the um, kind of the standard of it as well. Um, so just a brief story time. When I was younger, um, I <laughs> this is embarrassing to admit, but I did not know um, that you could write things on a computer in anything other than Microsoft Word. Um, and this is a story that I, I tell and something I admit about myself when talking to students um, and people who need to understand today's students as well. Um, because especially when I'm trying to talk about like digital literacy and the idea of digital natives, um, where, <laughs> yes, I'm seeing Taylor get excited because this is a topic we talk about a lot, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and the idea that the younger generation simply understands how computers work is so far afield. Like the younger generation, if anything, they're very good with interfaces and they're very good with the suite of tools that they are given and shown how to use. And so I didn't grow up learning the way that the older generation did about communicating with a computer when it was only the command line, you know? And that gives you like an understanding of computers and how they work um, that you just can't get when you grow up in a world of word processors. And so the way that I kind of go <laughs> with this story is that I really thought I could only, um, only type in Microsoft Word. And I, in sixth grade, got really into typing because I had this novel, this 300 page novel that I was very passionate about. It was like my whole thing. And all I ever wanted to do in my spare time was work on it. I had no plan for it, by the way. This is just kind of like Virginia Woolf, you know, free flowing, you know, just nonsense, but it was fun. <laughs> and so I, like, I just wanted to have it with me all the time because I I never wanted to give up the opportunity, pass by the opportunity to work on it. And so I thought I was very smart. I would bring around a little USB drive with my Microsoft Word documents on it. And um, it, whenever I was around a computer that I would plug it in and see if they had Word and see if I could work on it. And then if they didn't, I would be all upset um, because I'm like, oh, I can't work on my book now. Um, and when I think back on that time in my life, I think, oh man, I really wish that I had known about plain text editing because I was so limited and, and so needlessly limited um, in that time. And I just, I have all these vivid memories of, of, of running up against that door. Um, so I, <laughs> I try to explain to students and you'd be surprised there are a lot of students who don't know what don't understand what a word processor is or the fact that something like microsoft word is proprietary and it has a bunch of code that makes it look the way that it looks um and the difference or, or even that. like the idea of like document file model and like paths mm -hmm. and stuff right mm -hmm. like there's no particular reason someone who like learning the how to use a computer for the first time today would really need to know about the idea of files on a file system and yeah. what they look like, right? Yeah, like we're saying, we've kind of even kind of glazed over of like what plain text is, but I don't know mm -hmm. that I'm necessarily qualified to explain like, like from a computer science standpoint, the difference, but you know, that is to say like, there is just text in this file, right? Like, and a lot of things on a computer are like that, you know, not that aren't just, notes and things right like your configurations on a computer might be plain text too but um but like that concept is not a given necessarily that people would know that i certainly wasn't familiar with that either for a very long time and i don't know that i have like as compelling of an actual anecdote but there definitely would have been a time for probably until maybe high school i would guess where i would have thought the same thing it's like yeah if you want to write something 
that's not an email, I guess. Mm. Uh, like I would need Microsoft Word, especially at that time. Like Google Docs wasn't really a thing for me until high school. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that's, you know, that story I just used to highlight how important portability is, A, and just try to chip away at that notion of um, the myth of a digital native and um, how important it is to for people to know about being able to write in a platform agnostic way. Yeah. yeah. So that brings us then to um, to using it in Hedgedoc. Yeah. Well, and and one one thing, you know, we we did the importance of plain text and and as an add-on to that markdown, right? Like there's a lot of different ways you could write markdown, but other than hedge doc too, right? You could oh, yeah. you know, you could open up text edit on a Mac or a notepad on a PC and start mm -hmm. writing and save that as any name and file extension really you want. Technically, the file extension doesn't matter. Um, or, you know, most of the time we see that plain text as .txt um, mm -hmm. or .md is often indicative of, hey, this is a markdown formatted plain text file, but there's no technical difference, right? It's right. just a convention. Yeah. Um, the tricky thing with markdown and learning markdown is, you know, when you do it like that in just a plain text editor, um, you have to kind of know and memorize and you'll, you will memorize the main things, um, pretty quickly cause there's not like that much to know. Um, but, uh, you have to kind of know and memorize the syntax So like, Oh, here's how I make a heading. Here's how I make something bold. That's two asterisks and italics is one asterisk. Um, and like, as we kind of showed really quickly, like, uh, something that's aware of Markdown like Hedgedoc can really speed that process up for you because you can, yeah. you don't have to have everything memorized. There are other markdown editors, but the nature of plain text is that uh, most of them are local editors. So they're a program you install on your computer that will help you write markdown. If you've used many of them, um, like Typora is one and Obsidian, I think we both use for note taking. And those are great tools, but they're not really collaborative. They're designed for editing a file for the most part that just lives on your computer. And where Hedgedoc really <clears throat> breaks this thing wide open is for, for me is it is a markdown editor that's pretty simple to use that is collaborative, that you can have multiple people editing at the same time from a server. Um, so yeah. it's not stored on your computer. Right. Um, so let's um, let me get my screen back up and we will kind of showcase what you can actually do with um, Hedgedoc. So um, this is our instance of Hedgedoc that we use at Reclaim. It's at docs.reclaimed.tech. Um, Hedgedoc is a self-hostable tool, so you can run it on um, just about any type of uh, Linux um, server that runs Docker. Um, we did a stream on making a uh, one-click installer. And then last week, we did a stream showing off that one-click installer. So you can run it really easily on Reclaim Cloud. I will also mention I accidentally closed the Hedgedoc documentation. Of course, I have too many tabs open and got too into closing things. But they have really good instructions on how to install it. And they also have. Um, community page where they have different places that you can run it so you know we we um we run it of course on reclaim cloud and it's really really simple to use it there but there are other places this isn't just a you know um this isn't a proprietary platform in any sense of the word um we're not going to talk today a lot about how to install it or like the technical system admin kind of stuff we did a stream on that, like I said, last week. We're going to link that if you're curious about how to set it up yourself on Reclaim Cloud. It's quite easy. We really want to focus on what the tool can do once you have it set up. Um, so I'll sign in really quick here. And in our particular instance, uh, we have GitHub sign in turned on. 
Um, so that's that works um, kind of seamlessly. But there are also um, other uh, there are other uh, sign in methods, and by default, you can just make accounts based on email address. Um, so right. you can just give people accounts who should have accounts, and um, it's you know private in that way of only the people you give will have access. Right. Um, you do when you log in. It, it doesn't have much uh, in the way of organization. Basically, uh, files have names and they can have tags, and you can search through your entire, all every file you've ever made in HedgeDoc that you still have. Um, but there are not like you know uh, heavy like folder kind of you know organizational elements. Um, it's really just a list of files, basically. Um, there is, um, however, a uh, whoops. Um, there is, however, um, like I said, tagging, which I haven't gotten much into, but um, probably yeah. should. <laughs> um, and I do love that you can search across everything. That's super cool. Um, so I'm going to make a new note here. So if I if I make a brand new note, note this is what it's basically going to look like for pretty much any HedgeDoc instance, including ours. Um, there are three views in HedgeDoc. There is a, this, I'm going to go right to left. <laughs> um, and basically there's this pencil view that lets me just write text. Um, demo document. This lets me write some text. Cool. Um, and it's full screen. This side by side view, which is I think really the thing on HedgeDoc. This is the thing that I use almost all the time. Um, and I think this is the cool feature of it, it, which is you can write text on the left and on the right side, you can see a preview of what it will look like. Um, Honestly, I think that that is like the instant gratification of HedgeDoc for me, just knowing, cause it's like, you don't need to see, I mean, this is, you're literally looking at two views of the same content but it just motivates me for some reason when I'm writing <laughs> in Markdown to just see it being beautifully formatted on the other side. I'm like, oh, this is satisfying. It kind of depends for me, to be honest. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I would, I use the side by side. Whoops, uh, I use the side by side view most often, definitely. But um, I occasionally will find myself switching to just this, just editor view if I want to really encourage myself to not worry about formatting. It's like, no, I just need words on the yes. page. So I kind of like that I can have that option and it's just, just click a button and I can flip yeah. back and forth. Um, but I will say, yeah, most of the time I use this, this particular view. And then finally this one, which just shows the preview. So it's not, this is not an editing view at all. You can't right. really edit much of anything from here. Um, one thing I do like about this um, sort of preview view is I, I like how clean and simple it is. Um, and I also really like uh, that you can get like a basic table of contents over here, um, as well as links to um, different headings. So if I make another heading, like a, let's say heading two, um, and I'll make yet another heading two and a heading three. <laughs> um, if I go to that preview mode again, you can see that it's automatically generated a basic table of contents over here. So um, if I was to do, put something more useful here, like um, HedgeDoc is a Markdown editor, all about Markdown. Markdown is a plain text. Yeah. Um, HedgeDoc is a self-hostable tool. You can kind of see here that um, navigating this um, becomes a lot easier because of this sort of dynamically generated table of contents. And obviously, we have a small document here. But if it's much longer, that's actually quite a big help. And it's all linkable, too. So when I click on this little yeah. link icon, it actually will change the URL so I can uh, automatically link right into that if I want to show someone something I'm working on, which is really kind of neat. Yeah. Um, there is, of course, um, all of these nice... So Markdown, everything you can do in Markdown, you can do just from your keyboard because it's just 
symbols and text. That's all Markdown is. But there is this uh, toolbar that gives you shortcuts to all these things. This is super nice if you, A, just aren't a keyboard shortcut person. Um, and I think more importantly, if you don't know, <laughs> which is kind of where I find myself most of the time, I'm constantly forgetting, how does Markdown want me to format an image again? Right. Because that's where this stuff gets a little bit complicated, right? Yeah. Um, so Markdown doesn't only support plain t uh, just text. You can embed images and um, and links and things like that too. So um, let's read links. So um, in Markdown, um, basically you can have a, well, let's, let's link to the Reclaim Ed Tech website. Reclaim Ed Tech. Um, I can, in Markdown, if I know this already, uh, put square brackets around this and then type a link in parentheses after that. That is one way to do a link. And that works great. But let's say you didn't know that. <laughs> um, this helps, uh, um, HedgeDoc is going to help you with this a lot. So you can just highlight a word and turn it into a link. Or you can even just, um, sorry, yeah, I can highlight a phrase and then click this link button. And it's going to automatically start turning that into a link for me and do all of the syntax for me. And, and what I love about that too, not to interrupt, is that it just, um, it's kind of teaching you how it works as well. Yeah, it's it's kind of beautiful because because it's Markdown, when you click a button, you see exactly what happens, right? Over here, it's like, oh, it just spit out some text and now I can edit it, right? Like it's mm -hmm. it's simultaneously making it easier and faster, but it's also teaching you. So um, I, I should have shown here too, if I just click this link button, it's just going to spit out an empty link for me. So I can just go in here and say, ah, here's... Um, uh, let's go to the events calendar. How about that? Re Oops, reclaim hosting. And reclaim hosting events. Um, the other kind of cool thing, this is not so much a hedge doc thing, I guess, but uh, Markdown in general is the way Markdown does links. It really encourages you to do links in a good accessible way where you write a actual title for your link instead of doing this <laughs> where you just have a link yeah. on the page you can do that if you put a link on its own in markdown um it does most editors will make that just a nice clickable link but um it's nicer better it looks better it's more accessible if you're using like a screen reader or all kinds of other uh tools to write an actual title and markdown makes that pretty simple um yeah so. i love that um so and that's I love that you know sometimes I, oh, I think what's great about the WYSIWYG too is it, it teaches you, it makes it quick, but also like sometimes when you're just like you were saying earlier, just writing, just trying to get stuff out, um, you don't want to always have to click back in and then add in those symbols um, manually in all the right places. So like you got to put the square bracket and the part of the sentence that needs to be um, being able to just highlight and click the button so that you can just get you know, go go back and add that format after is really convenient. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, some of these we won't go through all of, but of course it's got bold italics, strike through headings, which literally will just, you know, <laughs> make various sizes of headings or, uh, you know, in the, the hierarchy of headings. Mm -hmm. um, code, which uh, I actually have not used this particular one. I think what what but what this will do is if you write code, you can highlight it and it will mark it as code the way Markdown does. So um, if I do this, it's going to put it automatically put it in um, the back ticks um, mm. syntax, so I can have it in a little code fence, or whatever. So let's say it's you're talking about Docker. Okay, there's my Docker command. So. Um, that's what what the code button will do is if you highlight something it will turn it into that um, and uh, make a code fence for you basically um, quotes which is super nice too um, so if you're quoting something this is a cool quote just makes it pop yeah me just now <laughs> um, 
you've got uh, bulleted lists, and I use bulleted lists and Markdown all of the time, uh, personally. Um, and the nice thing about that is not only will this make a bulleted list, but it will support like using the tab key to indent and right. shift tab to out dent. Is that the word? Whatever. Reverse <laughs> indent. <laughs> um, um. <laughs> well, let me also just point out too that you made a bulleted list without even kind of realizing that you did it yeah. <laughs> earlier. So like you can use a, a dash like that, or you can use the asterisks. Um, so there's a couple, it's not super, super strict. It kind of gets, gets what you're trying to do. Um, yeah, yeah, I think this is a good example of, I think technically the markdown spec says it's an asterisk, mm -hmm. but I use a dash just because that's what I, that's the convention for me. And both HedgeDoc will let you do either one. So if I, if I continue this bulleted list, it's going to automatically be like, ah, yeah, here's another thing, another bullet point and I can indent it further. And that gets into the color coding you were talking about, right? So you can see here that cool. because it marked this in blue, it's recognized that, ah, that's a bulleted list. Yeah, um, and then it's also, like you're saying, doing that that additional formatting that happens when you, when you press tab. So going from the filled in bullet to the open one and all that kind of thing, so. Yeah. Um, so th similarly, um, it, you can do numbered uh, lists too. Um, oh, and something else to point out about Markdown too is that line breaks actually mean something. So if you notice in the your quote section, you don't have, um, I mean, obviously oh, yeah. line breaks mean something, but you need like like space mm -hmm. um, because that is also going to determine how things look. And that is one of the things that I trip on still to this day, as you can see here. I didn't actually mean for this to be like that, mm -hmm. but the reason that works that way is that is how HTML works, right? So mm -hmm. in terms of uh, it's 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 trying to closely align, mark, Markdown and HTML are kind of closely aligned and you don't have to use it or think about it this way, but everything that Markdown can do is designed to be um, directly, directly tra yeah, yeah, directly translatable to HTML. So that's where some of these like writing conventions can be a little bit weird in Markdown and that's where having a, an editor that has preview is super nice because I left to my devices, I do single line breaks all the time and that's not actually how you're supposed to do it in Markdown. So right. um, there's checkboxes, which is kind of cool. Um, they're, they're pretty simple, but if I hit the checkbox button, it's just going to do a unordered list with uh, square brackets. And if you put that in with an X, it'll check it off. So yeah, I love those. Yeah, and it's um, I particularly like um, them uh, in uh, in HedgeDoc because you can check them on the preview side, and it will actually edit it over here, which is kind of yeah. nice. Um, so love it. Um, yeah, so that's checkboxes. We already talked about links. Uh, images. Um, images is a big one. The way Markdown does images is you write a link to a image file mm -hmm. and then you have a exclamation point that previews it. So I'm going to do it the long way and then we're going to do it the HedgeDoc way in a second because there are a lot of things actually that HedgeDoc makes this simple um, because uh, images are kind of a sticking point for me with Markdown editing. It's usually a pain point. So um, because Markdown is just plain text, if I was not using a fancy editor, I have no way to preview my what my images look like. So if I go find an image on the internet, like I'll go to the reclaim.tech site here really quick. And if I just grab, say, let's... Yeah, let's grab this link here. So link to this image. I open it in a new tab. Cool. I can, of course, in my demo document, I can just paste that in. And then if I make it a link, the, the markdown way, um, you know, it'll it'll be a link. <laughs> a link to an yeah, well, let's see, what is that? It's a TV that says splashing around installer with installer trend apps. All 
Okay, so that's a link. That would be great if I typed all the words correctly. If I throw an exclamation point at the front of it, um, it becomes an actual link in the document, which is super cool. So that's that's great. The problem is, what did I need to do that, right? I needed a image already on the internet <laughs> somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to like paste it in and write that out. One cool thing with Markdown is this text I put in here that was the title of the link, this becomes alt text for the image, yeah. which is super nice. So, you know, technically you can leave this empty and it will show up. But um, again, Markdown kind of encourages you like, hey, you got an image there. It's got a sad, <laughs> you know, empty square brackets with nothing in it. You should put alt text there. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like that Markdown is, because it ties to HTML uh, so closely, it is kind of of the web and in, in some ways encourages you to author content in a way that um, is, you know, more accessible uh, later on. So, um, so that's great. But it was a lot of steps, honestly. In this case, I already had an image, right? I didn't have to like upload it or anything. But let's say yeah. you're writing, doing something from scratch and you're like, I have a cool image. Let's say I go to, I don't know, the this particular page here and I want to screenshot this website for a second. We're going to use this as our image. If I screenshot this on my computer and just save it to my desktop for, for upload, now I have to go like put it in WordPress or maybe on like my cPanel file manager somewhere accessible. That's no good. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. it's just, it's a lot of steps. So HedgeDoc actually simplifies this greatly and you can hit this little upload button and I can just pick this image from my desktop, hit open, and it's gonna automatically insert it as an image and you'll see that it actually uploaded it to its own file storage so that this can be served up. So if I look here, there's my image I just had. This is such a time saver. If you've ever worked with Markdown images before, this is huge, honestly. Yeah, that's really big. Um, and then I can I go really in here and put things on Flickr. Yeah. Like... <laughs> I used Imager a lot for it, right? Yep. Um, and um, and then like Obsidian was honestly a revelation for me with this for local notes because Obsidian lets you just kind of drag or copy and paste images yep. in and it will put them in the right place in its file structure. HedgeDoc does that, but for public notes, which is huge and yeah. on the web. So, and I can still go in here and write my description as I want. So let's say I've got this gorgeous, useful document that probably has all the words spelled correctly. And I want to have this be something that not just I can see. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. There are other, there are other things in Markdown too. There's also uh, in uh, um, HedgeDoc, you, you do have a table uh, thing, which will just kind of spit out a table for you to work with. Um, the line tool, which just makes a line on the page mm -hmm. and comment, which is kind of, I haven't really used this one. And I didn't, honestly, I don't even, I didn't even know Markdown had an idea of comments. I think this might be kind of a hedge doc convention, honestly, hmm. but the idea here is you can have comments and it basically just treats them as quotes in Markdown. Gotcha. So, um, but, uh, but it's nice. Um, the table thing is also nice. Markdown tables are bad. If you have to do a lot of things in tables, um, Markdown's concept of how you manage tables is really tricky because you have to like, Manu like let's say I want a fourth column. I have to go in here and like do all of this. It kind of breaks it temporarily and yeah. Yeah. D technically you don't have to have like the same amount of stashes like that. It's flexible. But, but still, but if you don't, then it looks weird and yeah. It's HedgeDoc saves you some time. This mm -hmm. isn't I'm gonna call this is not entirely HedgeDoc's fault. <laughs> um <laughs> but it, they, they're you let's just say don't put your home budget in a markdown file probably <laughs> like you're not gonna there's no calculation or anything like that it's it's a little annoying to do spreadsheet stuff here but it's okay for basic basic tables um so i've got this document i want to share it with someone and um there or maybe have someone help me edit it so over here on the right side there is all of the permissions tools 
Um, I can confusingly from this very menu, I don't think this is the best option for this to be right here. I can delete the note or I can share it with people. Um, I can see how they got here, but I don't love that this button is there. Um, very easily accessible. Yeah, it just feels like it should be in the menu menu. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the menu called menu. Um, so um, right from here, I can choose a bunch of different uh permissions things. There's some short descriptions here of like, okay, private, which is what this is right now. Only I, the owner, the person that created it can view it and edit it. Great. Protected. This says only the owner can edit, but forbid guests. And this is a really weird one. You'll, you'll, as you go through these, you're going to be a little bit, some of these make sense. Like anyone can edit. Some of them make sense. Only the owner can view it and edit it. Some of these are a little bit weird. What I would highly recommend if you're wondering about permission stuff in Hedgedoc is go back to the main Hedgedoc page, click on your account thing, and go to features. This will bring up a markdown file that just goes through all of Hedgedoc's features. And it actually has a fantastic little table that shows you what the different permissions levels are and what they can do. Yeah, that is an absolute lifesaver for me because having to kind of critically read the options there um it doesn't it's not yeah it's not it's not great i i reference this quite a bit when i am like worried about the permission like if i have a specific thing i want where it's like okay i am okay with amanda and myself being able to edit this but i don't want anyone to view it even or edit it other than mm -hmm. like people that can sign into our instance. That's when I start consulting this table, basically. Yeah. Um, I will say they are doing really good work. Um, Hedgedoc, the team, uh, the, the open source contributors to Hedgedoc are doing really good work on a 2.0 that really greatly simplifies this and will kind of eliminate the need for this table in almost all cases, I think. Yeah. Um, and we actually do briefly take a look at that in our stream. Um, we're, that we did on kind of the sysadmin side of Hedgedoc. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll also uh, mention if you're curious about where Hedgedoc is going, they have a developer preview instance at hedgedoc.dev that you can check out. This isn't available just yet, um, but you know potentially soon they're on in an alpha version. But basically they're doing some work to simplify this a little bit. But for right now, um, this 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 table is what I would recommend checking out. Um, so let's say I want to share this so that Amanda can sign in and, and edit it. And also anyone can view it, anyone who has the link to it. Um, I would probably want this locked one, uh, which would allow guests to read it, but not write. Um, oh, I guess I suppose I also want signed in right. So let's that's what I want is actually editable. This is where the table comes in handy. So this means yeah. owner, me, Taylor, can read and write. Anyone signed in can read and write. Guests can also read. So I'm going to change it to editable. All, that's all I have to do. Now I just need to grab this link and share it with Amanda. And Amanda, I'm going to put this in our Slack really quick. And Amanda's going to sign in and uh, she'll in. be able to edit it. So as soon as she logged in, I got this little thing up here. It says, hey, changed. This is funny. My computer time must be behind because it says you change something a few seconds from now, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is weird. Um, but if I refresh, it says changed a few seconds ago. Um, but you can actually see this kind of little preview of these are the people who have done anything with the note. And if I go here, um, can you make some changes? Um, yep, to the working note? on it. So it's literally live preview here. As Amanda makes changes, I can see them. Amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is the um, the the really cool thing about Hedgedoc is it is truly Google Docs level collaboration. We can see people typing and editing things. Um, you can, I believe, even see where cursors are. I'm not 100% sure about that one. Yeah, you can. Um, so on your side, you can see that I've got my cursor. Yep, yeah. So I can I can see Amanda's cursor jumping around, which I may sound like a small thing. I think it's not. When you have like more than 
even one person on a document, it's good to know that everyone's about to type over the top of each other, right? Yes, like, because that um, absolutely, we all know that happens in Google Docs. It happens in Edge Doc too. <laughs> yeah. So this is fantastic. Uh, we've been using um, HedgeDoc at Reclaim for various projects um, for, uh, yeah, like about a year and a half or so. Um, and this collaboration stuff is, for Markdown anyway, second to none. I haven't seen anything that does it quite as good. Ether, Etherpad can do some of this, but um, Etherpad is not really a Markdown uh, optimized tool like HedgeDoc is where it can do um, preview for HedgeDoc and all of these nice niceties around it. So Yeah, and like I think a big thing is that if we wanted to move this somewhere else outside of HedgeDoc, that's what we're going to do in the rest of this course is we're going to take this right here and we're going to move it. And the only thing that's really moving is the what you see on the left, you know, just it's we've got all of that is just text. We don't have to worry about it being, you know, super specific to HedgeDoc. Um, and then we can just move it somewhere else. Yeah. So a couple other interface things here in HedgeDoc. So um, besides the collaboration features and everything, there are a few other options under um, at, up at the top here. So publish, this is really just going to give me a way to look at that preview view without any of the original like interface around it. Um, and I can, again, share this link with anybody. So this link is... Um, because I set this to be editable, which means if I look at our features document here, that means guests can read. Guest means someone who's not logged in at all right. in HedgeDoc. Um, this is publicly accessible, um, which is super cool. Um, and the beyond publishing uh, in the menu here, there are some other things. You can check out revisions to the document, which is really interesting. So I can get a timeline here of how this has changed. Google Docs also has a feature like this. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually download the markdown files of each of these. So I can say, yep, give me a copy of this one. Or I can revert it. That's or I can cool. just copy, right? Like I could just yeah. say like, oh, you know what? I got rid of that link. Let me copy that out, hit cancel, and just paste it in over here and bring mm -hmm. it back into my doc. That's super nice. Um, the slide mode, we didn't do this, um, but technically, um, there are there is a there is a standard by which you can actually make presentation slides in Markdown, and this will um, automatically preview them. Now ours is going to look awful because we didn't write it like slides. <laughs> um, but if I was to make a new document really quick, and I won't do much with this, but you just use separators. So this is a slide. Another one. And if I go to my slide mode, those are the slides. Oh, I think I actually, I got this a little bit wrong. You have to, I think, include, hmm. Yeah, this is, this is bumping up to my knowledge of Markdown. Yeah, so it looks like that first one is the title, not not an actual slide. But my point is, if you're authoring slides in Markdown, you can preview them and actually present from this, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, something I want to learn about, actually, for, for, for future presentations is to use HedgeDoc as my slide editor, too. Um, this The rest of the stuff, though, gets really powerful. So you can, um, in HedgeDoc, you can enable GIST import and export. So just are just single file GitHub repositories, basically. Um, so I can actually take this demo document here. And this is this is starting, we're, we're, we're dipping our toes into publishing, right? So mm -hmm. this isn't getting into, um, HedgeDoc is mostly about editing, but we can do a little bit of publishing in HedgeDoc too. Um, I can actually export an entire um, document right out to my GitHub account. So Right here, instantly, I have this demo document.md file um, all linked out, including, which is super cool, like all of the images too. Um, and uh, 
you could, if I'm GitHub just allows secret or public notes. So I could take this, hit edit, hit make public. And now this is a URL that I could share with anyone, um, which is super cool. Um, separately, though, I can also import uh, gist um, from GitHub. So if I go to my main thing here, let me grab this. Yeah, here's one. Um, if I go to this, I, I do believe I'm, I will need it to be public. But if I take this markdown file and hit menu import, oh, not a valid URL. I think I have to um, get maybe the raw URL. Actually, now that I'm saying this, oh man, hmm. I haven't used that feature before. I'll have to I'll have to look at that a little bit more. I haven't imported uh, just, um, but this is probably just um, one of those things where I'm not doing this quite correct. Um, but you can theoretically import from GitHub as well. The thing to know though about just is that the they they themselves right like if you've written it in Markdown. I can also just copy this entire thing, right? I can copy the yeah. text of this and make a new document and paste it in. And, and now I have a complete perfect. copy of it. Yeah. Especially because the images are also uh, public images already. Now, yeah. this is kind of a weird example because we made this one in Hedgedoc. I exported it out to a gist, like, I don't know, a while ago. And now I pulled it back into Hedgehog, but you know this works the same for anything written in Markdown, which is super cool. That ability that I can just copy it and paste it, and it is the same is I think super powerful. Um, yeah. So uh, further than this, we can also download things as Markdown um, files. So that's really just going to export the plain text out. So if I open this now, um, in my downloads folder is that file. I'm just going to open this with with just a complete plain text editor. This is what the file is. Um, but if you have a, a another editor that you like, maybe like Visual Studio Code, or um, I think I have a VS Code window open already. Um, I don't want it to take me over there because um, I've got a <laughs> I use Visual Studio Code for my blog, so it's I've got a blog post underway somewhere else on my computer. Mm. Let me use, well, it's going to be public soon, I guess, but <laughs> Typora is a markdown editor that I've used before. Um, and it, so I can just instantly get this file right into that editor, which is super cool. Um, another one I can do with this is export it as HTML um, and raw HTML. So the difference here is raw HTML is going to literally just run the markdown conversion basically on from markdown to HTML. So this just this is just an HTML file. There's really not much style information here. If I look at the source of this, this is just HTML tags, just simple HTML tags. Um, so that's cool, um, and you know you could you could keep that if you wanted it in that format. But I think is even more interesting is this normal HTML one, not the raw one. This will do the same thing, but make it look like that publish um, page does. So if I open that file I just exported in a browser, it looks like this. Nice. And the really cool thing with this is. It's just an HTML file, right? So I can actually upload this to like my cPanel if I wanted to. Yeah. And I have a basic one page like set of documentation or a site yeah. or instructions or something. Well, that's like the power of Markdown being directly translatable into HTML is you don't have to write all of this out in HTML. I mean, yeah. that's a, no one wants to do that. That's ridiculous, right? But so you can, get this fully formatted HTML version just by writing some simple markdown. Yeah. So it's 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 super cool and I love that you know it's as simple as that like here have a file this could be a website, right? This one file could be a website. Mm -hmm. Um and if you go in here it's kind of interesting from like a technical level because 
it is still basically like that really simple HTML tags, but then it includes all of this other style information on the page, basically. So um, it's all portable. Like all you need is this one particular file. Um, and even this is relatively editable, right? Like you could go in here and see like, oh yeah, here's a list item. <laughs> and um, these are some links. Like if, if you've looked at HTML before, nothing about this is super um, hard to parse basically. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, going back to my demo documents. Um, yeah, that's really, that covers all of the, the import and export options that, um, that uh, Hedgedoc offers. Um, but in, 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 it doesn't do a lot, but the great, in terms of other formats besides HTML and Markdown. Mm -hmm. um, but the great thing about Markdown is, again, there's a whole ecosystem of tools around it. So while we can, you know, go to GitHub with, um, with Hedgedoc or download as a file, throughout the course of this, um, the next few weeks, we're going to do more things with our Markdown files we do and we make in Hedgedoc and, and non-Markdown files too. Some of the other tools we're going to cover um, can work with all kinds of different files, which is super cool. But, you know, Markdown being this plain text thing, it it's just so easy to feed these files into other uh, formats and, and, uh, as you see fit basically. Totally. And that's what we're going to continue to do throughout the rest of this course. So I think that's a good overview of HedgeDoc and sets us up nicely going forward. Yeah. Um, so next week we're going to talk about, uh, Manifold. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really excited about that session. And we don't need to go too much into it because we're already a little bit over time, but hope to see everyone next week to talk about Manifold. Yeah. See you next week. Bye.